this week's program, I examine the case for why Israel should be extending its sovereignty over the Jordan Valley. I speak with Dr. Martin Sherman, CEO of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies, who explains why annexation of parts of Judea and Samaria is in Israel's best interests. Martin, I'm delighted to welcome you back to the Israel Connection on uh, JA Community Radio in Melbourne, Australia, and on this new fangled format of Zoom. It's a real uh, new experience for both of us. Uh, well, thanks for the invitation. And we're talking today about uh, the uh, matter of annexation that Israel is close to embarking upon. I believe uh, July 1 is uh, the date that's earmarked for this to happen. So uh, no, I, just, I just heard the news today that there's a lot of pressure to push that back, but I, I, I hope that will be the day. All right, let's, uh, let's wait and, uh, and see what happens on that in that regard. Now, I've got uh, my, first, my first question. It has long been the case uh, that Israel has been very dubious about the establishment of a Palestinian state, um, Martin, in Judea and Samaria. So do you want to tell us about uh, one of the pronouncements that, uh, or some of the pronouncements, in fact, uh, the first one by uh, Shimon Peres, who is a staunch advocate for peace and reconciliation with the Palestinians, who's, who's spoken on this subject. Uh, and uh, I want to bring those uh, comments up uh, for us to, to have a look here. So Peres, uh, staunch advocate for peace and reconciliation with the Palestinians, has spoken out on the subject. And this is a publication... Uh, that he came out in 1978. Uh, perhaps you want to uh, make some remarks about these uh, statements that were made at the time by uh, Shimon Peres, would, would you, Martin? Yeah, well, sure. I mean, I, these are, are, are remarkable uh, declarations by Peres in, in the book that you wrote, which unfortunately hasn't been appeared uh, in English, but uh, it, it's a Hebrew book. This is the translation from the Hebrew. And there he was very, very forceful in rejecting any Palestinian, Palestinian state. And for good reason, because uh, he pointed out that uh, the whole of the coastal plain would be in range exactly as uh, happened in Gaza. As soon as Israel has uh, relinquished territory, that territory has immediately become a base for launching attacks in Israel. Uh, and I think... Uh, you, you know, the thing about him is that his predictions were, were, were so accurate and you cannot understand why someone who made such well-founded statements about the dangers uh, would suddenly adopt a completely unfounded uh, credo and uh, basically precipitate all the dangers uh, that, he, that he warned of. Uh, it, for me, this is a, a great conundrum uh, and it seems to be... <laughs> You know, in these, these, these days of, of, of COVID-19, to use the word virus might be appropriate. Uh, it, it seems to be a, a virus that has infected much of the, the uh, intellectual and military and political elites in Israel, uh, who basically ignored and negated everything that once was a given. Uh, you know, I know up until the early 90s to suggest a Palestinian state was a uh, borderline sedition. Uh, in fact, people like uh, A.B. Natan were actually in prison for making contact with uh, the PLO. Uh, the contacts with the Palestinians was a criminal offense punishable by, by uh, uh, incarceration. So uh, there's been this dramatic uh, metamorphosis in the in, in opinion. This is so remarkable because the original opinions prove to be true. Every time that Israel has, has relinquished territory, it's become a platform from which Israel has been attacked, whether it was uh, in Gaza, whether it was in South Lebanon. Uh, we see now Sinai descending into one of the most brutal places on the face of the earth, uh, being uh, uh, under the control, of large portions of it being under control of jihadi warlords. And so there is very little empirical uh, support or theoretical foundation for land for peace. And so I find it remarkable that people are still clinging to this, uh, this dogma. 
why has Israel taken, not taken advantage of uh, the euphoria following the Six Day War to annex uh, Judea and Samaria? Uh, why, why did Israel uh, hold back at that time? And now uh, that faces a lot more difficulty than it may have back in uh, 1967. Well, I, I think the feeling then was that the victory was so crushing that it would break the will of the, of the, the Arabs to, uh, to attack us again and that the land could be used as a uh, bargaining chip. I, I think this was a total misreading of the uh, uh, geopolitical situation in, uh, in, in the Arab world. And uh, I think they came to the table, so the virtual table, which they never actually got to, with, uh, with ideas that were completely out of touch uh, with reality. You know, it was uh, the British uh, clergyman, uh, William Menger, who said that, that it's uh, useless for the sheep to pass resolutions about vegetarianism when the, the wolf has a different opinion. And I, I think that uh, this was basically a, a misjudgment of, uh, of uh, how the Arabs would uh, react. Uh, the Arabs refused to acknowledge defeat. They refused to believe that the fledgling Jewish state, which was only 19 years uh, old then, could uh, inflict such a massive uh, defeat on the Arab world. And uh, they thought that if they kept up the hostilities, uh, Israel would eventually be defeated. Uh, and you know, and much of what they thought today is true. Israel has basically relinquished most of the territory uh, that it uh, took in the 1967 uh, war, uh, apart from uh, the Golan and uh, parts of uh, Judea and Samaria. But as I said before, every time that Israel has withdrawn from territory, it's become a, not, not, not a gesture for goodwill, but it's become a platform to attack Israel, whether it's in South Lebanon, or whether it's in Gaza, uh, as I say, in Sinai as well. So every, every time Israel has relinquished uh, territory, uh, it's never basically even managed to harvest the fruits of peace, but only the, the bitter fruits of hostility. So Martin, I'm going to bring up uh, another uh, quotation here. I think you can see it on the, on the screen. Yes. This is, this is a, uh, can you perhaps tell us about this? This is a statement made by uh, Eugene Rostov, uh, who perhaps you can tell us who he is as well, which relates to a map that was produced at the time um, that uh, showed what uh, was uh, passed on to the US Chiefs of Staff as being Israel's minimum security requirements. This is back in 1967, following the, yeah. uh, the Six Day War. And I've got the map on the uh, screen at the moment showing uh, what uh, was deemed to be necessary for Israel's security. Perhaps you can talk about what uh, Eugene Rostov had to say. Well, well this is a, a remarkable map. It, it wasn't passed on to the Chiefs of Staff. It was formulated by the Chiefs of Staff for President Johnson, demarcating areas which the American Chiefs of Staff thought was essential for Israel's security. And as you can see, this includes the whole of the Golan, Virtually all the highlands of, Ju of Judea and Samaria, uh, aka the West Bank. Interestingly enough, it does not include the Jordan Valley, but it does include uh, portions of Sinai uh, and, uh, and, and Sharm el Sheikh in the, in the, in the south. Um, this map, by the way, uh, was the publication was suppressed for many years by the State Department because they didn't want this to undermine negotiations uh, with, with, with the Arab side. But Eugene Rostov, who's the senior uh, American diplomat involved in the formulation of 242, who knew exactly what the Americans had in mind when they, when they passed the resolution, said that the resolution doesn't mean that Israel should give back all the territories that it took hold of in uh, the 1967 war. And it, it uh, included uh, a provision for secure, for secure and defensible borders. And from this map, we can see what the American chief of staff Chiefs of Staff uh, considered defensible borders. Uh, as I pointed out before, the whole of the Golan, uh, most of uh, the West Bank, Judea and Samaria, is definitely the highlands overlooking the coastal plain. And uh, this is something that uh, I think should be put forward forcefully by, uh, by Israel. 
Um, Eugene Roster, as I said before, was a, a Deputy uh, Secretary of State. Uh, later, he was uh, the head of the Yale Law Department, the dean of the, dean of the, the uh, Yale uh, uh, Law Department. And so he has a lot of authority, both in terms of diplomacy and in terms of the knowledge of the international law. So I'm going to um, play a, a video that's been produced by the Israel Institute of Strategic Studies, which uh, will uh, demonstrate uh, why it's uh, vitally necessary for Israel to uh, maintain a security presence in Judea and Samaria. And perhaps uh, after we've uh, watched that, we can uh, come back and uh, you can elaborate on what uh, this video has uh, demonstrated, the one that was produced by uh, the IISS. Hello to our viewers and welcome to our video studio at the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies, IISS. For over two decades, the notion of two states for two people has been the dominant paradigm that has monopolized the discourse on the Arab-Israeli conflict in general and the Israeli-Palestinian one in particular. Our institute, IISS, has long been in the forefront in opposing this idea and has worked resolutely to expose the existential dangers this policy proposal entails for Israel. In the short video, we illustrate one aspect of the perils that Israel and Israelis can expect if the two-state principle is actually implemented. One of the gravest threats, but one that for some reason has received scant public attention, is the threat that would arise to the nation's major transportation axes should a Palestinian state be established in the areas adjacent to Israel's coastal plain. In numerous articles and interviews in the past, the founder of the Israel Institute for Strategic Studies, Dr. Martin Sherman, has warned repeatedly of the dangers involved in the proximity of borders of the envisaged Palestinian state to some of the country's principal traffic routes. One of the most important of these routes is the Trans-Israel Highway, Highway 6, that connects the north of Israel with the south. Several portions of Highway 6 run close to the territory designated for a future Palestinian state, and in some places is even immediately adjacent to it. In numerous locations, the distance between Highway 6 and the Palestinian population centers is less than one kilometer, and in some places, only a few dozen meters. Little imagination is needed to envisage the gory outcomes that are likely to occur if Israel were to relinquish control of the area that abuts the highway. Israel's harrowing experience following its pullout from Gaza must serve as a red light warning against what we can expect if the area east of the highway is transferred to Palestinian control. Two locations are particularly sensitive, the towns of Kalkilia and Tulkar, that are located immediately adjacent to the highway and in the past have been the sources of murderous attacks of terror, such as the horrific carnage at the Park Hotel in the coastal city of Netanyahu. Only continued Israeli control of the eastern flanks of the highway can prevent the continued bloodshed and violence inside Israel. The menace of terror tunnels and attacks can't be dismissed as unfounded scaremongering. To the contrary, in the recent past, attempts to dig such terror tunnels under the security barrier were exposed by the Israel Security Services. The intensive agricultural and commercial activity in the vicinity of the wall provide ample cover, concealment and camouflage for the excavation of terror tunnels and for setting up firing positions close to the busy highway. It's not difficult to envisage the ease with which it would be able to lay deadly ambushes along the course of the highway, or to envisage the huge economic damage that would be caused by the constant threat of disruption of traffic on the major artery connecting the north and the south of the country.
In conclusion, some words of warning from Professor Amnon Rubenstein, Israel Prize laureate and former Knesset member and Minister of Education for the far-left Merit faction. Israel, small and exposed, will neither be able to exist nor to prosper if its urban centers, its vulnerable airport, and its roads are shelled. This is the terrible danger involved in the establishment of a third independent sovereign state between us and the Jordan River. Perhaps you can uh, explain uh, why it's so necessary for Israel to maintain uh, a security presence in Judea and Samaria based on what we've just seen. You know, I think one thing that Israel has not managed to convey to the world is how critical the area designated for a Palestinian state is for its security, both day-to-day -day safety of its citizens and for its long-term uh, strategic needs. The video, of course, shows one aspect which hasn't always been uh, conveyed sufficiently, and that's the danger to its main traffic routes. Uh, basically, in any configuration of a future Palestinian state, uh, the border would uh, be within uh, meters in, in some places, uh, 50, 60 meters of one of the main uh, traffic arteries in Israel, the Trans-Israel Highway, or as it's known as Route 6. This would expose traffic on the road to, to mortal dangers, whether it's uh, mortar attacks, whether it's even a short tunnel and people could pop up and ambush vehicles on the road. Uh, it could totally disrupt the, the north-south traffic uh, in Israel. But not only that, from the highlands which have been designated for a Palestinian state, as I say, in virtually any configuration that's been discussed, is that the Palestinians control, both in terms of firepower, observation, electronic surveillance, everything that goes on in the coastal plain. That means uh, airfields and Israel's only international airport, uh, ports, military, military uh, ports and uh, civilian ports. That means major infrastructure installations and systems like power stations, water conveyance, centers of military command and uh, civilian government, and 80% of the civilian population and the commercial activities. Now, these would all be in range of weapons being used today uh, from territories relinquished uh, to uh, Arab control, or Palestinian control. Um, and the significance of Judea and Samaria is much more severe than in Gaza. In Gaza, you have a 50-kilometer border abutting a, a sparsely populated rural area, where in Judea and Samaria, you would have anything from 500, even perhaps even 1,000 kilometers, depending on the configuration uh, agreed upon. Uh, with Israel having total topographical inferiority as opposed to the Gaza situation where there's no topographical uh, significance, you would have this border of, of as I said, 500 and 1,000 kilometers, which would be almost impossible to control. And if Israel were to have to launch punitive uh, campaigns as it has in Gaza, it would be much more difficult because the terrain would be much more difficult, the collateral damage and the international condemnation would be would be far more severe. Uh, so you know, I'm struggling to find the rationale for why Israel should relinquish its territory, as I say, given the past record. And so today, basically, uh, land for peace in Palestinian states is a Palestinian doctrine, and I would say a Palestinian dogma, that has got no empirical support and virtually no theoretical rationale either. Israeli Prime Minister, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu has said that Palestinians living in the Jordan Valley will remain in what he described as an enclave after Israel annexes the territory and will not be granted Israeli citizenship. Now, is this going to work? It seems to leave the Palestinians in limbo land, although this fits in with the strategy I think you've been advocating for quite a long time to, uh, to encourage uh, migration of Palestinians out of uh, the West Bank to other Arab countries or, or elsewhere? Well, I, th I think you're quite right. I think this underscores what the right wing is getting wrong. Uh, I mean, I, I certainly believe that Israel should annex all the territory from the river to the sea, because I think that's the minimum it needs to, to uh, uh, ensure its security. But on the other hand, 
there's a demographic problem. You know, I, I look at it in terms of a scissors analogy. You, you need two blades of a scissors to cut. And Israel, to support uh, itself as the, the nation state of the Jewish people over time, uh, needs to deal with two imperatives. The one is a geographic imperative, which mandates that Israel must control the territory up to the Jordan River. And the other is the demographic imperative, which means that Israel must use uh, as far as possible the presence of a recalcitrant uh, non-Jewish population within that territory that it needs uh, to, to extend its sovereignty. And the only non-coercive or at least non-kinetic way without using violence is uh, to encourage emigration of the Arab population by economic uh, incentives. You know, I, I would be happy to hear some other uh, alternative, but you know, basically everything's been tried and failed up to now. Uh, the two-state solution has been tried now for, for one-third of a century and brought nothing but trauma and tragedy to the Palestinians. It's brought death and destruction to both sides. So, you know, at some stage you have to reach the conclusion that, that, it's, that it's wrong. And on the other hand, uh, I think that uh, uh, leaving the Palestinian population where it is today is a sure recipe for the Lebanization of Israeli society. Now, if you accept those two, or at least if you, if you cannot refute them, then the only solution is uh, large-scale immigration with uh, tempting incentives for the Palestinians to find a better and more secure life elsewhere. You know, and, and when I compare the, the morality of these two alternatives, on the one hand, a Palestinian state is almost certain to be yet another homophobic, misogynistic, Muslim-majority tyranny. And I don't know even the, or anyone who's even the most uh, enthusiastic supporter of two states who believes will be anything else. And on the other hand, you have a policy that offers uh, a better life for non-belligerent Palestinians elsewhere. And so if you compare these two, on the one hand, a homophobic, misogynistic, Muslim-majority tyranny, or a better life for non-belligerent Palestinians elsewhere, I think the moral decision is clear. Obviously, you should offer, offer, offer the Palestinians a better life elsewhere, rather than living under the dysfunctional and uh, despotic rule that they live under today. Martin, how come uh, so many senior security personnel endorse uh, territorial concessions when uh, it, what you've been saying uh, might seem uh, pretty, pretty obvious? Now, I'm going to play uh, an excerpt uh, which uh, demonstrates this question. Uh, this is from an interview that uh, you conducted earlier this year with Major General Reserves Gershon Hakohen, I believe, who was an associate with the IISS. And uh, I'm playing a short section of that, which uh, where he uh, talks about uh, four premises that uh, have been taken by these Israeli generals that support what uh, the IIS views as being perilous territorial concessions. So uh, we'll watch that and then we'll come back after that uh, just to summarize what the, these premises are. Okay, Martin? Okay, just let me turn up my, my air conditioning here. It's getting a bit hot. <laughs> certainly not the case here. Why do these generals support us? What's, what's the motivation? Um, I, I analyze them by making a construction of four premises that they are taking in uh, the foundations of uh, justifying their attitude. I just analyzed four of these premises and I found all of them irrelevant and uh, disconfirmed by reality. And I'll just begin to uh, describe these four principles. The first pre premise of them is the idea, it is of course a wrong idea, that was a, again and again repeated by American ambassadors and others, like Martin Indyk, for example, good fences making good neighbors. It is true about John and Smith in Texas going on Sunday to the same church that they need good fence between them. We see how that worked with the Hezbollah. It is absolutely not true between uh, enemies like Israel and uh, Hezbollah, Israel and Hamas, and we have a concrete example what happened since the withdrawal of the disengagement in 2005. I was a general commanded the troops to uproot the Jews from Gush Katif. I know exactly, and I told them what will happen. I told the general staff what will happen later after our withdrawal. And 
we build excellent fans, and is it really making good neighborhood? Yes, yeah. So this premise is just disconfirmed. The idea that we will make this engagement, uh, they will be there and we are here, is wrong because the fans doing exactly the opposite. The fans delivering Hamas, for example, protection uh, to build absolutely well-formed military organizations. They are not anymore just a group of terrorists. Basically, we have given them the freedom to operate unhindered. Of course, they have a institution of headquarters well-formed, a command and control coming from that, battalions, brigades, a weapon systems uh, building, and th beyond that, the fence creating a definition of casus belli. It means we lost the freedom of action. In Judea and Samaria, if we are entering night after night to Nablus due to information that we are getting that something is prepared, it is not a casus belli because there are not clear definitions of fence here and there that we are crossing a fence. So, so again, I'll, I'll please what's, what's the motivation if, if everything's... I mean, I'll just describe the premises. It means the first premise is disconfirmed. The second premise is that after Israeli withdrawal, the legitimation for the government to take decisions, if something will go wrong, they are prem the premise is like that. The withdrawal will create new balance and even promote peace. But it is the premise that, in one side, the withdrawal will create an emerging better phenomena of peace, of, or if not peace, at least a kind of stability with a balance, that here and there will create a balance, and this will create stability, and stability will create peace. But the other side of that coin is that if things will go to the wrong side, then the governmental uh, decision-making will be very easy because we did all our goodwill to withdrawal. Now we can attack. Why it is a disconfirmed uh, premise? Because we just got the evidence in the last year. Once it is exactly before Yom Ha'atzmaut. Once it is a... Uh, in the time that we must uh, give attention to the first priority of the northern uh, threat, like yeah. the tunnels in the yeah. northern. It means that theoretically, it is easy to take the decision. Practically, with the circumstances, it is absolutely not easy. The third premise is that the IDF superiority is so dramatic that in several days, the IDF can destroy all the potential of the enemy and peace, or at least tranquility or stability, will come back to the region. It is wrong because the war will take not just a week, much more than that. We saw that in 2006 at the Lebanese war. It, yes, and it is not because IDF became a more and more a week in comparison to the past. A lot of telling me, we are the heroes of 67. What we did in one day, you cannot do. General Jackie Evan, and he was a deputy of Sharon in crossing Suez Canal, told me, I, as a company commander in 1956, Amu company commander, uh, made the whole uh, conquest from the north of Gaza Strip in uh, Bet Hanun to Rafa. I told him, what it is? A lesson? Today, not with Tank Sherman, with Merkava uh, 4, you will enter to the first street of Bet Hanun and you will not go to the other side. Because the threat is absolutely different. A lot of uh, uh, traps, a lot of snipers, a lot of uh, equipment, a lot. It is really changing. Uh, and it is not that IDF is not uh, brave as it was. It is that the circumstances of a battlefield are really uh, different, and we can uh, learn that from the Americans, that they lost more than 4,000 uh, good soldiers in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq, and the warfare in Mosul. 
against ISIS, with American command together with Iraqi troops, Kurds, so Mosul compare it to Gaza. And if we will withdraw from Judea and Samaria, the offensive will begin in Netanyahu to come to Nablus, or offensive that will begin in Be'er Sheva to come to Hebron. It is an operation of weeks and months, not just several days. It means that the third premise is also disconfirmed. And the last premise is that due to the withdrawal, we will get a clear and absolute uh, international legitimacy to operate our forces. And we can ask again and again, after Kaslid, we got Goldstone report. And uh, after the last year, in every fighter engagement in uh, uh, the border in Gaza. There's always inter international condemnation or international uh, and commendation. And we are invited to hug uh, civil yeah. rights uh, violation and all that. Yeah. Uh, crimes of war. This is what they are uh, claiming against us. War crimes, yeah. So uh, all these four premises are wrong. So how they are ignoring that they are reading the wrong decision? Beyond that, they are telling me you are frightening the people. You are scaring the people. You are telling them that they will be threatened by mortars from Kalkilia, they will be attacked by anti-tank missiles. I told them, you are also scaring the people by telling that we will suffer from demographic threat, we will lose the Jewish state. And my answer is that I'm analyzing that through uh, the method of risk management. For me, the risk of staying in Judea and Samaria, even without uh, the autonomy that they have in uh, zone A and B. Today they have uh, absolute uh, autonomy. It means that 90% of Palestinians are controlled directly by a Palestinian authority, not by Israel. There is no occupation in Judea and Samaria since January 1996, and no occupation in Gaza since uh, May, June 1994. So even though they can threaten us by telling that they are giving back the keys and the Palestinian Authority will collapse and uh, vanish, okay? I prefer this threat upon the threat to begin a warfare from the narrow seashore in a situation that the main front in Judea and Samaria will be so close to the main strategic uh, centers of Israel. Okay, so I'm still wondering, you know, why, do, why do these generals hold these positions? I and mean, why do they hold the four premises that you talked about? It could be that they really lack imagination. Uh, one of my uh, duties as reservist today is to manage uh, the strategic exercises for the general staff and to territorial command. And of course, an exercise in, at that level requires imagination because I'm not just training them in what was already known. I'm trying to train them in what could happen. And also could be that they are not really learning the whole lessons of the last uh, experience of war in Donetsk, in, in uh, Ukraine, in China, the Chinese, how they are penetrating in the uh, uh, islands in the Chinese Sea with civilian uh, uh, fish vessels, fisher vessels, not just with uh, a navy. It means everything is hybrid today. They are not learning what made so many uh, troubles to the Americans, that they are the best army in the world. Why they are not uh, learning uh, the last eight years of civil warfare in Syria. There is a lot to learn from that. Did someone of them learn it? I think that they are not really uh, real generals that really like uh, the profession of warfare. And there is great difference between expertise in small uh, op uh, special forces low, operations low intensity and warfare. warfare. Part of the Israeli IDF uh, Excellency, and especially in the general staff generals, that they are coming from special uh, units, special forces, and all these uh, special operation forces 
uh, are really uh, dealing with uh, micro tactical uh, challenges. It is like a brain surgery. Uh, an expert of brain surgery, if he's coming to be a manager of a hospital, is really irrelevant. So Martin, we're back, uh, we're back now. We heard uh, Gershon Cohen, he, he elaborated uh, the four premises. For, firstly, the one that they believe that good fences uh, make good neighbours. Secondly, that uh, well, there'll be a new balance and peace will, uh, or at least some stability will arise from that. Uh, and military responses will then be legitimate if there is a renewed Palestinian aggression. But he argues that uh, this might be okay in theory, but uh, not in practice. It's not easy to implement. The third premise is that the idea of military superiority is so overwhelming that Israel can achieve decisive victory quickly and restore stability. This is in case there's uh, some uprising uh, or, or incidents that Israel needs to address after making these concessions. And fourthly, uh, withdrawal uh, by Israel uh, will, uh, will gain international legitimacy for IDF action if uh, trouble starts after Israel has made uh, concessions. So uh, do you want to make any further comments uh, based upon what uh, Gershon Cohen has, has had to say? Well, I, you know, I, I think, I think he, he's a bit lenient with these uh, uh, military personnel because he, he gives them as if that he imposed a sort of rationale, which I, I'm, I'm not sure that I agree with. I mean, I agree with the fact that he, that he refutes these principles. For instance, the first one, when he talks about uh, the belief that, that good fences make uh, good neighbors, well, we can, we can see that's certainly not the case either in the South or in the North. We have excellent fences, but very bad neighbors. Uh, we, we see that with Hamas, when Israel withdrew uh, uh, under the premise that if we leave Gaza, uh, they'll uh, busy themselves with uh, improving their, their socioeconomic situation and uh, uh, try and enhance progress in, in, in the Gaza Strip. This certainly has proved completely false. Uh, the same in the south of Lebanon. Israel has uh, withdrawn to the last millimeter. Uh, of the international border, and the, the Hezbollah has been stockpiling uh, more and more weapons and has developed from being a, a terrorist nuisance to a grave strategic threat. So the first premise that good fences make good neighbors certainly uh, does not hold. Uh, the, the second one is that if we withdraw, there'll be some sort of new balance, which certainly hasn't happened. Uh, and that uh, we would be able to uh, counterattack or retaliate certainly hasn't happened either because as, as uh, General Cohen points out, there's always some reason not to do it. You either have got uh, some international uh, event on in Israel which you don't want to endanger or your attention is uh, diverted to something else like uh, the, the, the northern border. So the second premise doesn't hold either. Uh, the third premise that uh, Israel has overwhelming uh, military superiority is true, but it's not as if that you could sweep through Gaza in, 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 in a day. As he's pointed out, that uh, you will get in, uh, embroiled in uh, long weeks of fighting as was in the south and certainly was in the north in the, with the 2006 war against Hezbollah, where despite the fact that Israel had uh, overwhelming uh, military superiority, the war dragged on and on and on, and inflicted uh, quite a number of casualties on the Israeli force. Because unless you do have a, a philosophy is that you're going to not try and reach peace, you have to inflict such a crushing victory on them, which basically negates the whole theory that you have a prospective peace partner. Uh, and uh, the, the fourth premise about international legitimacy is also proved false because every time that Israel has been forced to retaliate and to protect its uh, citizens against uh, aggression, uh, we've had international condemnation, uh, the climax being the Goldstone Report, if you, if you uh, yeah, remember. fully remember. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I believe that uh, these, premise which, these premises which uh, uh, General Cohen attributes to his uh, colleagues are, are false. But, uh, you know, I, I believe in many ways this is more a sociological phenomenon 
where up until now, you know, being left has been sort of a bon ton, and people who leave the military and want to uh, uh, progress uh, with their socioeconomic status in their post-military careers have found it far more, uh, uh, let's, let's say, far, far more useful to be in the leftist camp than to be in the rightist camp. I think in many ways this has also been the fault of the right wing who have not been very uh, effective in presenting their case. I think they, for, for, for a long time, uh, they've let left, the left wing dominate the public discourse. I mean, that's changing now, uh, it's perceptibly, where there are a lot of sort of right wing people in uh, uh, central positions in the media. I don't know if your Australian uh, listeners have heard of people like uh, El Segal, uh, Palman Lipskin, uh, Lino, uh, who used to be very left-wing, has moved sharply to the right. Uh, Avri Gilad, who's also moved from a leftist position to a, a much more uh, right of center position. So, so, so there is a perceptible change in, in the media. But uh, I, you know, I think in, still in the bon ton uh, segments of the population, you still have this lingering notion that you are progressive and enlightened if you uh, want to uh, advance Palestinian uh, peace. But Palestinian peace, as I say, this is a very perverse paradox because by supporting Palestinian statehood, you're basically supporting an entity which is going to be the antithesis of everything that you profess to believe in. You know, it's really not going to be a model of democracy, gender equality, uh, religious freedom uh, and uh, social uh, pluralism. Uh, it's going to be none of that. Uh, and so I find the support for Palestinian state, particularly by the liberal sector in Israel, completely paradoxical and completely perverse. So we we have a um, a uh, strong, a fairly strong support. Well, we certainly have a majority support from Israeli citizens for this move of annexation. We've seen uh, Benny Gantz join Netanyahu, so uh, we have uh, no argument really, uh, strong argument within Israel because uh, there are more people than, than not wanting uh, a move towards annexation. But um, with um, the current situation on Israel's eastern border with Jordan, according to uh, Ajed Iran, who's a former Israeli ambassador to Jordan, he, um, he believes that, uh, or he says that we really haven't had any major issues on the, on the border with uh, Jordan. So uh, why do we need to go now and sort of disrupt what has been generally uh, a peaceful situation uh, next to Jordan and, uh, and go towards annexation? Why is it so important to do it right now? Well, I, I think it should have been done long ago. I think it was just basically eliminates the uncertainty and eliminates uh, any impetus there would be for simmering uh, uh, un unrest. Uh, you know, I think probably the thing that would stabilize the Jordanian regime at the moment uh, would be putting a Palestinian state on its borders uh, off the table, taking it off the table. Uh, I don't think anything would imperil the Jordanian regime more than an irredentist Palestinian state uh, on its eastern front. Um, but, you know, we've always heard these gloom and doom uh, warnings in, in, the, in, in the past, whether it was the, U, the, the U.S. moving its embassy to Jerusalem or declaring Jerusalem the, the capital of, the, of, of Israel, acknowledging that it's the capital of Israel, um, acknowledging Israeli sovereignty over the Golan. Uh, we were warned that this is going to precipitate huge uh, uh, waves of protest and violence across the Middle East, and you know, it turned out uh, that it wasn't. Uh, another thing is, I believe, you know, I, I don't know whether the current regime in Jordan is the, the best option out of, out of any at the moment, but certainly I think in any way, no matter who uh, uh, succeeds the regime, we have to look at the regime that has a, a limited uh, shelf life. In fact, in many ways, I think it's uh, existed much longer than anyone thought uh, possible under the circumstances. But uh, I really don't think that uh, the King of Jordan, if he wants to stay in power, can initiate any real uh, uh, 
problem for Israel is dependent on Israel for many things, including water uh, and fuel. Um, I, I don't see that being so much of a problem. And even if it does become a problem, I think it's something that will that, be independent of that. I think you know, there's this very large anti-Israel sentiment in Jordan, uh, not, not in the regime, but, but, but in, in, in the public. And uh, I, I think that Israel should uh, take care of its interests under the assumption that uh, whatever regime there is in, in Jordan, either if it's friendly, it doesn't matter, and if it's, uh, if it's unfriendly, we certainly need the Jordan Valley. Well, certainly the, uh, the biggest threats uh, seem to be coming uh, from, from Jordan, although uh, we've seen uh, with other Arab states, they seem in some cases, especially with the Arab Emirates, showing significant agreement to Israeli sovereignty to the Jordan Valley and Israeli settlements in Judea and Samaria. So Israel seems to have changed this dynamic of unanimous Arab intransigence. So is this not um, a real uh, fundamental game changer, or an, an opportunity that Israel hasn't ever had before uh, for Israel to do what it uh, perhaps has been too apprehensive about doing in the past? I, I probably, yes. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a little skeptical about how stable uh, our uh, cordial relations with the, the, the Sunni world is. I, I think it's a, it's a function of two elements, two opposing elements. One, the fear of the of Shiite Iran, and uh, two, their uh, aversion towards Israel. When the fear is greater than the aversion, then you'll have a process that we're seeing now. And when the aversion is greater than the, the fear, we'll have the process that we saw in the past. So, you know, I, would, I wouldn't bet the farm on this being a, a stable relationship, but it certainly does, uh, does uh, uh, create an, op uh, an opportunity. On the other hand, the diplomatic uh, uh, side, if we do have the, the uh, support of the current regime you know, and depending what happens in the elections, that's why I think it's important to do it now because we never know what's going to, what the next uh, regime that is going to do, the next administration is going to do because, uh, as you know, the Democratic Party is far less favorably dis disposed towards Israel uh, than the current one. But even looking at Europe, I think Israel's diplomacy has been very successful in one respect is that it's managed to put a wedge into the, the EU. And at least up until now, decisions like sanctions have to be unanimous. And there isn't a snowball's chance in hell of them getting a unanimous decision today because you have all the Visegrad countries, all the Central and Eastern European countries being strongly pro-Israel uh, as opposed to the Western countries like uh, France and, uh, and uh, other countries that uh, so you, you have this, this strange situation now in countries which have been traditionally anti-Semitic in, in Eastern and Central Europe, now supporting the Jewish state, whereas the countries that have been traditionally liberal uh, have, have been far more critical of Israel. And so I, I think as far as, you know, and, and unless they change the decision-making process in the EU, which apparently would require a unanimous decision anyway. Um, so I, I don't see that happening in the near future. Um, Israel is likely to be protected by, by harsh measures from the EU which require a unanimous decision. So I think, you know, putting everything together, everything is lining up that now is the time to, to annex and, and, and sooner better than later. So Martin, uh, isn't the only real argument uh, against annexation the fear that there will be a huge violent backlash from the Palestinians and their supporters. Uh, and how do you fend off the argument that, that Israel will be potentially in breach of international law if it proceeds with uh, annexation? Th these are the, these are the, this is the big uh, stick that uh, especially um, the European Union is uh, going to hit Israel with if, if Israel proceeds with annexation. And then, as, oh. I, as I also said, uh, we've got the threat of uh, violence. So how do you think these are just uh, things that uh, Israel can override because uh, they'll never really uh, come to too much and Israel's opportunity at the moment is, is far greater than the risk? I, I definitely think so. I mean, uh, as I said before, uh, sanctions require a unanimous decision in, in, in the EU and they, they, will, they will never get a unanimous decision there because of countries like uh, 
uh, Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and places like that, uh, all, all the, the Central and, and Eastern European countries that are part of the EU, EU today will not permit such a decision. Um, I, I, I'm not sure that the Palestinian public today has a stomach for large scale violence, but uh, well, we, we withstood waves like that before. And I certainly think that the long term security interests of uh, the United, of uh, Israel certainly does uh, militate in favor of uh, annexation. Even at the moment, if it's partial annexation, because I think by annexing uh, just the Jordan Valley, uh, you basically will make any future Palestinian uh, state uh, untenable. I don't think there's enough territory, enough uh, infrastructure for it to be tenable. And I think the whole idea will basically implode, which of course brings us back to what we were talking about before. What do you do with the Arab population? And I, I really believe that uh, uh, the only way is to offer them a better and more secure life with some sort of uh, better, prosper, better prospects for greater prosperity in, uh, in third party countries outside the circle of violence uh, and out of the clutches of the cruel, corrupt cliques who've led them astray for decades from disaster to disaster. Um, you know, you know I, I really don't see any. Uh, uh, alternative to that, and uh, unfortunately, by promoting this idea, I have very meager resources at my disposal. So, I, at the moment, I, I don't think I've had great enough impact in, in, in bringing this uh, home. But I see slowly people are beginning to, to at least listen and understand the logic behind it. Yeah, I mean, I would tend to agree perhaps uh, we don't have to fear. Uh, an excessive outburst of violence. We've seen this uh, uh, unfortunate uh, Palestinian uh, man who, disabled who was uh, killed by, uh, uh, by Israel in Jerusalem. We haven't uh, seen uh, necessarily such a, a huge uh, backlash uh, following the, uh, the death of this Palestinian man, this disabled man who was unarmed in Jerusalem when only about 150 people turned out uh, for his uh, funeral. Uh, we haven't seen anything like uh, the reaction that occurred in the United States uh, for this uh, police officer who uh, stood on the neck of this uh, this uh, black man and uh, killed him in, uh, in very unfortunate circumstances. So perhaps uh, what you're saying is is right. The the, the Palestinians have not got the, the stomach for the kind of upheavals that we've seen in the past with the Intifada. Yeah, I, as, as I said, I think you, I think you you're right, and I think. It, Another thing that emphasizes the difference between the two societies, the Israeli society and the Palestinian society, is that uh, when Palestinians kill Israeli civilians, uh, they are lauded as heroes and, and uh, held in high esteem. Whereas uh, when Palestinians are killed in some, which looks like an unjustified situation, uh, the, the Israeli, Israeli society and the Israeli uh, law and order system reacts immediately uh, to bring retribution to the people who committed these misdeeds. So I, I think that, under, that underlines the huge difference between two societies as well. So I'd like to thank you, uh, Martin, for this uh, unique experience uh, talking today on this uh, subject of annexation. Uh, I, I think there's a, a quote that I think I caught uh, that you put up there somewhere, which I think uh, illustrates the position that uh, we should consider here. And this is by Voltaire, the uh, French writer and philosopher, and his quote, uh, present opportunities are not to be neglected. They really visit us twice. Exactly. <laughs> so I think yeah. that uh, perhaps sums up the situation and uh, is a quote of Voltaire's that we uh, definitely concur with. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, thank you very much again, Martin. It's always a, a pleasure to, uh, to talk to you. Thank you for hosting me. I appreciate it.